because it's not plugged up. It should look like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, it, 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 let's start here. Okay. So and, and then I'll I'll take you through that. So this is the, the when the bomb was being rebuilt because mm -hmm. it was rebuilt from the blueprints. Um, took twelve years. It was finished in two thousand and seven. Okay. There was no anyone left. No, they were all even, destroyed. But everyone, even in the United States, not in the United States. There, so, there so is a shell of one, but it's only got half its components. It's not functional. So U.S. also destroyed. Yes, all destroyed. Really? Oh, yeah, because they thought they may need to use them again, so they didn't want them to become public. So Churchill was the main one. Churchill said, we've got to keep the secret in case we have to do all of this again. But when they sold the Enigma to all countries, so they yes. can decrypt the, the communication yes. in, in all the commonwealths, etc. Yes, yes, yes. They should have had some bomb machine to decrypt it. And they did, but... So, the story is, Churchill said at the end of the war, mm -hmm. destroy them all, and apparently all of them were destroyed. But GCHQ wanted to be able to break enigmas that had been given, so they kept 16 back. Oh, so, they did. so they did and keep 16. They, they walled them up, the inspector came, all the rooms were empty, fine, and then they broke the walls down, and they used them until 1960. Um, so Idi Amin had been given enigmas, and they read all his messages using the bomb. Okay, But in 1960, they were all destroyed. All Again? Destroyed. Again. Now, this time they really were all destroyed. Because nobody uses this, uses this technique anymore. So, okay. in 19... And I think that the Americans probably were not less smart than the British, and they probably kept some in order to decrypt what it, the British it, give it's possible, sold away. <laughs> it's possible, but unlikely, uh, because they'd moved on. Um, so the only the only one we know of is in the museum, mm -hmm. but it's it's only a shell. It hasn't got most of the components. So just it, to show you what it looked like. Uh -huh, but it, so it cannot work. Really. It cannot work. No, no. So in 1997, John um, his name is John Harper. Mm -hmm. He decided to rebuild it mm -hmm. as a retirement hobby. It <laughs> took 12 years with 60 people helping, mm -hmm. and it was working in 2007. So this is what it would look like. Each of the, each of those shelves would have, and this is a, called a Letchworth Enigma. Each three vertical mm -hmm. is, is a single Enigma, and I'll explain to you what it does in a moment. Right? But this is what it looks like when it runs. The top top drum spins around at about 90 RPM. Every time it goes around once, it pushes that one on. And when that one's been around once, it pushes that one on. When it finds a position it's looking for, it stops. Okay, all right, so that's the machine. Now let me tell you the, let me tell you what it does. I'll, I'll go in here, so we've got that as the background. Yeah, you can't come in here though, because it's um, very dangerous. <laughs> yes, this machine would never be allowed to be built today, because it is unprotected, 200 volts, 12 amps. So if you touch things, you, uh, Find yourself dead. <laughs> okay. All right. So, the, let's go back to the beginning. So, this machine was built to allow the British to break the Enigma. Now, we haven't got our real Enigma there, but we've got the photo of one. Um, so, the Enigma was a, a battery-operated electromechanical enciphering machine. So, it allowed the Germans to type in their secret message in plain text. The Enigma would turn it letter by letter into cipher text. So this is a typical output, okay? This is the cipher text, uh, and normally it runs, this is only a segment of it, it runs to about 256 characters. So the Germans had typed in some unknown plain text German, Enigma turned it into this, this was given to the radio operator, he sent it out as Morse code, all right? All the receiving stations would hear it, write it down, so they had the seat, the cipher text, they'd give it to their Enigma operator, he would type in the cipher text, out would come the plain German, okay? So, very, very simple process. Now, the reason it caused all this trouble was that Churchill basically said, if we don't break the Enigma, we're going to lose the war, because the U-boat captains using the Enigma were destroying the convoy system. Mm -hmm. okay? So, um, he asked for the machine to be analysed, and he was told it was unbreakable, because to break into the machine, you've got to find the daily setting, all right? 
So what I described, the two, two enigmas talking to each other, only works if they both have the same setting, mm -hmm. the daily setting, or key of the day it's called. The problem with the key of the day was that the number of ways you could set the key of the day through the components of that machine was huge. Um, just short of 159 million trillion, okay? There was no technique available um, to find that one setting out of that huge. So it was regarded as unbreakable, this machine. So what they did was they set up Bletchley Park, brought 200 mathematicians here. They analyzed the machine and they created an attack called the probable phrase attack, okay? Now, this attack is uh, structured using a, a probable phrase or a crib to allow them to find what particular configuration of the removable components of the Enigma would allow them to turn the ciphertext back into plain German. All right? So the way they did it, they got the girls at the Y stations, the wireless intercept stations, to write down the ciphertext in the correct order, because they were listening in, and also to use triangulation to find out where the message came from geographically. Because if you know where it came from, and you know what installation is at that geographic point, you should be able to guess the plain text phrase the enigma turned into this. So this one is from a German weather ship. Okay? And they knew it was a weather ship because it came from a fixed point in the North Sea. So they said this is the enciphered version of a weather forecast. So almost certainly the word weather forecast will appear somewhere in here. The German word for it is this one. Better for her saga. Mm -hmm. So... This is your crib, so to run the attack, you run Enigma backwards, and you say, right, what specific key of the day setting did they have to use so when they typed in that sequence of letters, they got this sequence of cipher letters out, because it will be just that one unique setting, okay? Now, to do it, to run the attack, you've got to line up the correct plain letter with the correct cipher letter. So the problem is, where does it fit in this stream? If it, you know, it could be there, it could be here, it could be here. So Turing said, well, we can use a characteristic of the enigma to help. The enigma cannot encipher a letter as itself, okay? Design feature done on purpose to say, stop you typing in a plain letter word and having the cipher text read exactly the same if it did every letter the same. So what he said was to start at the beginning and just keep sliding it down until you find a position. So this one can't work because of the G. If you slide it down one, this can't work here because of the E. Slide it down one more, this can't work because of the A. But here, it's possible that this word was turned into that sequence of cipher letters. So, what Turing said was, and the rest of the mathematicians, we need to invent a technique where we can find what setting would allow us to type in vetter for solver and get out that sequence. Now, this was Turing's brilliant moment. What he realised was, that when he finds that particular setting, each plain letter became, becomes the correct cipher letter, all right? So what he did was he built a machine, the bomb, to allow him to load each of those pairs onto its own enigma, a three drum enigma, okay? So he picked 12 of those and loaded the 12 onto the enigma on the, on the bomb. And these 12 in yellow are the 12 he's used. Okay, so the first one says he wants it to tell him when N on the input becomes E on the output. Okay, the second one is this one. When does that E that came out of there turn into a V? So it's daisy chain. Do you understand daisy chain? Sure, sure, of course. And there it is all linked together. And you, you, the reason that you loop it back on itself is the bomb monitors that loop. Mm -hmm. And while that loop is not valid, it carries on running. Okay, so this is the bomb. These are the 12 Letchworth enigmas. There's three banks of them. So you can run different uh, permutations of the components of the key of the day. Um, you load it on here and you run it. And when it stops, these three indicator drums tell you where the machine got to. Because mm -hmm. it's going to try 17,500 positions, because that's the number of initial start positions the machine can have. When it stops, this information allows the mathematicians to derive the key of the day, all right? Now, the problem that they had was the original bomb victory um, needed lots of loops, all right? And if you ran this menu on it, you've got over 200 stops. Mm 
mm. which is unusable. Mm. There's only one's the correct one. So Gordon Welshman is the other name you need to take away, the, the mathematician. And he said to Turing, well, he said, why don't we fit a logical feedback loop on the back of the machine so that if it thinks it should stop, get it to test automatically if there's any contradiction in the parameters. If there is, don't let it stop. And the result was this menu went from 200 stops to four. Four stops you can do something with. So without Welshman, it actually probably wouldn't have, would have, would have failed. It wouldn't have succeeded. So you can take your four stops and you can test them on that machine. I with, see. Oh, the okay. checking machine. And it allows you to verify. That's, ah, uh, okay. Yes. It allows you to verify which of the four stops gives no contradiction across the whole menu. All right. And just to put some time scale on it, with a menu, this is a really good menu, with a menu as good as this, uh, you would expect to have the key of the day by 8 o'clock in the morning. And it was set at midnight. So by 8 o'clock in the morning, you should have the key. And you would load it onto your own Enigma. You type in your cipher text and make mm -hmm. sure you get the plain text out. It tells you it's the correct key of the day. Yeah. One last mm -hmm. thing to get the volume. Now, Bletchley wasn't just about breaking secret messages. It was about volume. So what, they, what Churchill was expecting was thousands of messages a day. So they had to use a machine called Typex. And Typex, we haven't got one here, um, we're still waiting for it to come over. Um, Typex had been built by the British government. They stole the German Enigma patent and copied it. But that machine, they added two more rotors. So it was a five rotor version, almost certainly unbroken in the Second World War. Because you can't break a five rotor version with one of these machines. So that Typex machine, they converted it back to an Enigma, with just three rotors, load the key of the day on it, and get the girls to type in the cipher text, and on the right, on the on a plain piece of plain um, paper, out would come the plain German. All right, um, and that allowed them 200 machines, 24 by 7. That allowed them to, by 1942, they were deciphering about a thousand messages a day. All right, and that's what prompted Eisenhower to say to Churchill at the end of the war, Bletchley Park had been the most valuable asset the Allies had. Because not only was he seeing the secret messages, but the sheer volume allowed them to see the big picture. Mm -hmm. And that's what changed it all. But I thought that Typex only started 43. No, Typex was available yeah. in 1939. 1939? Yeah. But the British used another coding machine before the Typex, no? No, Typex, no, no. Typex, was the, it, Typex wasn't a battlefield machine. It was only used by the senior officers. Mm -hmm. what but was two of them were left behind on the beaches at Dunkirk. Mm -hmm. That's so we know they were using them. So, so the German could the Germans have, captured them and yes. decrypted the Typex. No, no, because it's got because five rotors. Five. And but yeah. what other coding machines the British used? So there wasn't any specific. It was they were using all For various the field. types of, of uh, mechanical. Uh, none <coughs> of them were as complex as Enigma, mm -hmm. because. The problem you've got is that the more complex you make the machine, the more difficult it is for the receiving end to accurately set the setting. Because you don't, 159 million trillion settings is not the whole capacity of the Enigma. But they, 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 they said, right, we're going to keep some of these things and not change them. Because the, in, before the war, when they were looking at using Enigma, they said, the problem is the receiving end, if he doesn't get the setting correct, he can't read the message. So you had to be... You know, just take it to the level of complexity where it was complex enough, but people could accurately reproduce. So you need a very long German well, name like weather uh, yes. station. So, yes, yes. And and you need it, you need to know the location. Yes, and yes. You know, and you need to have but the fault of this. Not always, because weather will transmit every day. Right. So you and you know from where. But if you monitor, you know they, the Germans ran about fifty radio networks, and in the early part of the war, the best crib came from the SS network. And it was Heil because Heil Heil every Heil. SS officer signed off with Heil Hitler. But it's a short. It's short, but you could work out if you knew where, where they were. And it was SS, so you, you knew the kind of material. And that was the best one until about nine months into the war. Mm -hmm. And then the, a cryptologist, a German cryptologist, realised how weak this was. And he said to the SS, he didn't tell them, that he just said, when you've enciphered your message, cut it in half send the second half first and then so Heil Hitler was lost somewhere in the middle so you couldn't use it anymore I but see. it's ironic that it was the best crew wasn't it okay yeah, that's fine so what if is you it? come back another time we can show you the machine running
this. So that's not a real. Yeah. Yeah. It's because we're still we're going to be loaned one by GCHQ. The photos are not so useful. So that's that's actually the Enigma. Okay. That's a three rotor Enigma.